Good afternoon, church. Connie Scholl came up to me this, this morning, or this afternoon, that is, to, to tell me that they needed to announce the pastor appreciation uh, lunch party. I don't know exactly what it is. And she asked me if it was weird if we had Nathan announce it. And I said, it's definitely weird, so make him do it. Make him a little bit uncomfortable up here. Uh, but no, we, we are very grateful. I know Nathan agrees, but, but church, I'm very grateful for each of you. And just the support and love you guys show us year-round uh, makes, it, makes it very easy for us. So thank you. We're very grateful for that. Last week, I informed you all that for the past months, the elders have been navigating a matter of church discipline. Uh, we have prayed over this. We have taken the appropriate actions to call one of our members to repentance but so far, our efforts have failed, and so now we must bring a, this matter before you. We're not going to do that specifically in this service. After our service today, we're going to have a closed members-only meeting to discuss this matter together. But before we do that, we're going to spend our time this afternoon walking through the process of church discipline together as it is laid out by Jesus in Matthew chapter 18. In preparation of this, I preached from 1 Peter chapter 2 last week. And what we saw there was that as God's people, we are called to be holy. We are called to be holy before a holy God. We have been given a new life in Christ, and we now live as his representatives to the world around us. People's opinion of Jesus, of God, is partially sometimes entirely, going to be formed by what they see from his people. And so it's imperative that we reflect his holiness. And this is why we must practice church discipline. When one of us chooses to persist in unrepentant sin, we must take corrective action because it damages our witness as a church, but more importantly, it damages the reputation of Jesus. Jesus commands us to practice church discipline in Matthew 18. And that's where I'll be preaching from today, verses 15 through 20. Some of you may not have ever seen this process carried out in a church. Some of you, unfortunately, have probably seen it carried out improperly or carried out for the wrong reasons. And so before we actually brought this matter to you, church, the elders thought that, thought that the wisest course of action was for us to slow down and to take some time to consider what God's word has to say about church holiness and church discipline. It's very, very important that we are of one mind as we move forward in this process because this process is not something that the elders do by themselves. This is something that all of you participate in as members of the church. And when it's done well, this whole process rather than, than dividing us, should actually unite us closer together. You can open your Bibles with me to Matthew 18, verse 15. <clears throat> but before we begin, as you open your Bibles, I want you to look down to verse 21 and notice the passage that follows immediately after Jesus' teaching on discipline. I don't think it's a coincidence that the parable of the unforgiving servant comes right after this. This is a very famous passage. This is where Peter says to Jesus, Jesus, how many times can my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? How many times, Jesus? And Jesus says, Peter, I tell you, it is 77 times. In other words, he's telling Peter, keep on forgiving him. There is no limit. If your brother is repentant, you must forgive him. This exchange between Peter and Jesus and the parable that follows teaches us that forgiveness is always on the table. Jesus always offers forgiveness to those who repent. And so church, we should always offer forgiveness to those who repent. And we need to keep these themes of forgiveness and repentance at the forefront of our mind as we walk through Matthew 18 because it should frame our interpretation of church discipline. Church discipline is not a display of pettiness or of spite, it is a process in which all of us, the church, collectively, lovingly, and graciously pursue a member who has strayed from Jesus and call them to repentance. Let's read our passage together. We're going to read the whole passage here, verses 15 
through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. We can break this short passage into two parts. Uh, These two parts will guide the structure of this sermon. So you have in verses 15 through 17, the church discipline process. And then in verses 18 through 20, you have the church's authority. God's stamp of approval on this process. We're gonna start in verses 15 through 17, but as we work through these, I want you to notice a pattern. There's a goal here, and the goal is to keep this process as small as possible. As you see as we walk through this, things only escalate, that small circle only broadens when forgiveness and repentance doesn't happen. If step one brings repentance, great, we're done. Process over, we can go home. We don't need to go any farther. With every step here, repentance is an exit ramp. It is possible every step of the way, even to the very end, and even after the process is completed. And we need to keep that in mind, church, because I cannot stress enough that church discipline must always, always be redemptive in purpose. Look at verse 15 again with me. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So step one, a one-on-one conversation. This is what Jesus tells us to do. In this hypothetical scenario, there is one, one believer, one member of the church who has sinned against another. And Jesus speaks to the one who has been sinned against, and he says, hey, if that's you, go talk to him. Go tell him his fault. Go tell him, point out the way that he has sinned against you, but you must do it between the two of you alone. And the hope here is that there won't be any escalation needed. The ideal is that that they could resolve that amongst themselves and they wouldn't need to bring anybody else from the church and get them involved. So when a brother or sister sins against you, Don't sit on that. Don't don't just dwell on it and get angry and angry and let it fester and let resentment build and grow because that makes it worse. Don't go and tell everybody else in your small group. Don't go and tell the rest of the church. Go and handle it with them quickly and respectfully. Talk to them like mature adults should. If you do this and he listens to you, praise God, you've won your brother back. You have gained a brother. When that happens, we're done. No need to go any further. We can stop the process here and we can praise God that it was handled so cleanly and so smoothly. Repentance has taken place. It would be wonderful if every matter ended here, if it was resolved at step one. But we are sinful. We are people. We are stubborn. People are stupid We look the Bible in the face and say, yeah, I'm gonna do something different, something that this tells me not to do. So there's more to consider here, but before we go on to step two, I'd like to offer some guidance for how we give and receive correction and reproof. When the occasion requires us to confront another believer in their sin, we must do so with the utmost humility and gentleness. If you fly into that conversation like an angry maniac ready to chew out your fellow believer over how they've been treating you, it is not going to go well. It's going to escalate and make things worse because they're probably gonna match your energy and match your anger and resentment and most likely you're gonna find that you yourself have now sinned in the way that you've tried to handle this scenario. I wanna read from Galatians chapter six, just 
verse one. You can follow along or you can try to open there. It'll be a quick one. But this provides a helpful model for how we ought to uh, offer reproof and rebuke. So Galatians chapter six, verse one. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, you, are, you who are mature, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. We must be cautious of our own emotions. Things like this have a tendency to get very heated. It's very important that we act with gentleness so that we're not tempted to fall into sinfulness of, of responding in anger, of, of not controlling our own emotions. And if you're confronting someone out of a desire to get even or out of resentment, rather than to see repentance from them, rather to see restoration in that relationship, your heart is not right before the Lord. And chances are, you are going to make things much, much worse. So, so check your own heart. Make sure that your motives are in the right place always before you take this step. This whole process, I think especially this first step as well, works best when everyone involved is able to give and receive loving correction well. So if you feel that, that you must offer correction, make sure you do it well. Do it with humility. Do it wisely. Do it graciously. Because at the end of the day, you might be wrong. You might not have the facts correct. You might not have the necessary information. You might have misunderstood what they meant or what they were intending to say. So we don't run in guns blazing to lay into somebody. We approach with humility and gentleness, keeping restoration and repentance at the forefront. And if you're on the receiving end of this correction, you may not agree that you're in sin. If that is the case, let me urge you and encourage you, don't be angry with the person simply because they brought this to your attention. Instead, recognize that it's not comfortable to do that. Nobody wakes up and says, man, I can't wait to confront my friends over their sin. Nobody does that because it's super uncomfortable. But these people love you and they want you to walk more deeply with Jesus. So hear what they have to say. And it might be that they help you out of sin that you weren't even aware of. And even if they're wrong, appreciate the fact that they were willing to make themselves uncomfortable for the sake of trying to help you be obedient to Jesus. When I was a youth pastor at another church, I had a church member come and confront me over canceling a, uh, a youth event. And they even quoted Matthew 18 to me when they did it. And they were upset because I had said uh, we were going to have a youth event, rain or shine. No matter what, you can count on us having an event. Unfortunately, circumstances did not allow me to keep my word in that instance because a severe thunderstorm rolled in and then there was a surprise funeral that, that uh, happened to take place inside. So we didn't have outside, we didn't have inside. We couldn't do this event and I unfortunately had to cancel it. And, and this member was very upset and they felt that I was dishonest or misleading or, or something. I didn't agree with this member. I, I did not think that I was in sin here and I explained that to them. I did, however tell them that I appreciated them bringing this to me, that I would try to be more careful in the way that, that I communicated in the future. And after hearing my response, they agreed that, that I hadn't been in sin. And, and honestly, I think our relationship was ultimately better for that because there was a mutual respect and gentleness and concern for the other person. I understood they weren't trying to tear me down. They had a real concern. And I was grateful that they didn't go complain about me to everybody else, but they came directly to me and spoke with me about it. But had either of us acted arrogantly or angrily, then it probably would have driven a wedge between us that furthered that divide. Instead, because there was gentleness and concern and love for one another, trust and respect grew. Our relationship was better off for that. You see, that's the beauty of this process, church, when we as a church can develop that, that kind of intimate fellowship where loving correction is acceptable and it's done well, it actually works to prevent the whole rest of this process. Because if we trust each other enough to, to give this correction and receive this correction, it's gonna stop so many things before it gets to step two and step three and beyond. 
So let's do our best to ensure that we both give and receive this kind of correction with humility and grace. The example that that Jesus is using here is specifically for when another member sins against you. But what about when a member sins not necessarily against any other particular member? In those instances, I think that we need to act with wisdom. If you have no relational basis with the person that you believe is in sin, or if you're concerned maybe they won't respond well to you, I think it'd be appropriate for you to seek counsel from another wise believer and and get their take on it. You don't have to give them names or all the details, but you can ask them for some advice in that instance. It would be appropriate for you to come and speak with the elders to share that you're concerned about a fellow believer's behavior. It may be that the elders feel they need to step in. We may tell you, yeah, go ahead and deal with it and we'll give you some wisdom on how to approach that conversation. However, it would not be appropriate for you to go and share it with your small group or other members of the church. Remember, we wanna keep the circle as small as possible and we only broaden it when the current step fails to produce repentance. So when this first effort at reproof fails, we move to step two. Look at verse 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So step two, bring witnesses. Bring others with you. The application is fairly obvious. Bring witnesses. If the individual efforts fail, you call in other faithful believers. And calling them in really serves two two ways. First, it adds a measure of seriousness. It adds weight to your rebuke when there are other mature and trusted believers saying, hey, yeah, he's right. You are in sin. You are out of step with God's word. Two, It protects us from false accusations as well. In the second half of verse 16, Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. And under the Old Testament law, a single witness was not enough to condemn somebody. You could not just take one man's word and then punish somebody for what they claimed had happened. Because if that was the case, anybody who didn't like you could have you imprisoned or potentially even executed. And so Jesus isn't, isn't using this judicial language from Deuteronomy to say that the church needs to function and act like a court, but he is saying that our standards should be just as high. We should be very careful to protect against dishonesty and false witness and corruption in these kinds of matters. God detests a false witness. And so we must be very careful not to bear false witness, even if that might be on accident. And these added witnesses can help in that effort. Because we aren't exercising church discipline on hunches. This is not an educated guess about how someone spends their time. We only take these steps when there is clear evidence that sin has been committed. And opening this circle to a few trusted people, it helps to ensure that both parties are treated fairly. These two or three witnesses don't have to have actually seen the sin take place, but there needs to be a clear enough pattern or clear enough evidence so that they can attest that the individual is truly in sin and out of step with God's word. But I want to be clear again, this process, this process cannot be a witch hunt. It is a path to restoration and repentance when we are sure that sin has taken place. These witnesses are going to play a vital role. So it's vital that we're wise in who we bring into this process. Bring someone that you know already has some measure of trust with the sinning believer. Bring along someone who is spiritually mature, not a newer believer. Avoid bringing someone in who has a tendency to gossip. Don't plan a surprise intervention with your small group. You don't want to sneak attack them. Don't bring along someone who has a contentious relationship with the sinning member. For example, if, if I know that Alan and Keith don't get along and they're constantly fighting, don't bring, don't bring Keith to confront Alan. I know, it's a dour subject. We had to have something to, to break it up a little bit. I'm bummed Alan's not even here to see it, so you guys can tell him how much fun uh, we had at his expense this week. But, but if you know that these two people are contentious, that they don't get along, don't bring that person to confront him about his sin because it's probably gonna blow up and it's not gonna go very well. 
generally speaking, I, I think at this point, it is often the wisest course of action to involve the elders to some degree, to at least consult them and to be, so that they can offer guidance because they're gonna know the person probably very well. They're gonna know about them. They're gonna know what's going on if there's other things happening that you aren't aware of. And they'll be able to give you some wisdom and how you approach that conversation with the individual. Or, as I said earlier, depending on the circumstances, it might be best for the elders themselves to intervene and get involved in the situation. But if all of this fails, we still don't see repentance through these witnesses and through this confrontation, we proceed to step three. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Step three, bring the matter before the church. This only happens when all of our other efforts have been exhausted. We've tried to restore the brother or sister privately and we have failed in that endeavor. Only then do we make this a public matter before the church. But this third step, this making it public, this is not merely informational for the church body because the church body has a role in this as well. They're called to take action. Verse 17 says, if he refuses to listen to the church. So the implication is that once this information is shared, the church, you guys, the church membership, then take a little bit more of an active role, and you reach out to pursue this straying member. You call them to repentance as well. This step will look different depending on the nature of the sin and the circumstances. Sometimes it may suffice for the elders on behalf of the church to offer a final warning and a final call to repentance, but other times it's appropriate for the church members themselves to be the one reaching out to the individual and encouraging them to repent and letting them know that we are praying for them. That can be especially powerful when that calling and that, that urging is coming from, from those that the, love, that, the, that the person trusts or from their loved ones. At the same time, it, it says a lot too when, when even those who really don't know the person that well are willing to be that uncomfortable to, to reach out, to call them, to ask them to grab coffee so that they can encourage them to return and repent of their sin. But what's next? What happens when we try that, when the church does their role, and even that fails? Well, as we discussed last week, it simply is not appropriate to allow someone to live in open rebellion against God, to live in open sin, but then claim the name of Jesus and claim to be a member among us. We cannot tolerate that church because it will shipwreck our church's witness. It damages the reputation of Jesus in the community around us. So once we've exhausted our efforts to call this person to repentance to no avail, Jesus says that person should be as a Gentile or a tax collector to us. Those two groups, Gentiles and tax collectors, were not liked by the Jewish people. The Gentiles were not Jews. The tax collectors were considered traitors. They were considered outside the people of God. Jesus is saying is that if, if they won't even listen to the church, consider them an unbeliever. You no longer consider them as a Christian. It is heartbreaking when it comes to this church to look at somebody who walked with us, who was in our services, who, who we served with, and to say to them, we no longer believe that you know Jesus. If after warning and calling the person to repentance, they still choose to walk in their sin, then we can no longer in good conscience affirm their profession of faith. And I want to be clear on that, church. When we exercise church discipline to the very end of this process, that is what we're saying. Together, corporately, as a, a united body, we are saying we cannot affirm that your faith in Jesus is genuine any longer. You can go to the next slide there, Jacob. <clears throat> this is a very weighty statement for us to make. But I need to stress, church, that it is ultimately for their benefit. 
if all of the evidence we're seeing in their life points to them not knowing Jesus, how much more harm do we do to them by, by letting them think that they are saved and letting them find out only on judgment day that they're not and that it's too late for them now to turn and repent. While it is painful, this removal from membership is by far the more loving course of action. To say honestly, we, we just don't believe that you're a Christian anymore, but you can be. Please repent. Put your faith in Jesus. Turn from your sin and follow him. What comes after a person has been removed? How do we interact with a person who's been disciplined? Well, this is a very important question. Uh, and in my opinion, this is where so many churches get church discipline wrong. And they do so in part because they misunderstand Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which is another passage that talks about church discipline. And I'm going to read a handful of verses from there. You can turn there, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 13. Or you can just follow along on the screen with me. Paul writes, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Now the misapplication of Paul's words comes when you latch on only to verse 11 here. It says that if a person claims to be a Christian, but he, if he is guilty of living a lifestyle including these sins, don't associate with them. It says don't even share a meal with them. And so many well-intended churches had disciplined members out of the church and then instructed their members to utterly shun the people. Have nothing to do with them, don't speak with them, don't look at them. Essentially, you treat them as if they are dead. But church, I don't think that was Paul's intent. And that's certainly not Jesus' intent here in Matthew 18. If you look at the, the, surround, the verses surrounding verse 11 there in 1 Corinthians, Paul's concern was that when they discipline a church member out of the church, we should not act in a way that undermines that judgment that the church has pronounced. Paul says in verse 9, it would be impossible not to associate with the sinners of this world. He says you'd literally have to leave planet Earth if you wanted to do that. And the problem, if we did that, who would tell them about Jesus? Then in verse 13, Paul's concern again is that they purge the sinful person from their midst. So in verse 11, Paul is not making a blanket statement that we should shun anyone who is disciplined. If a husband is disciplined, should a wife then divorce her husband? No. If, if a husband is disciplined, should the wife refuse to speak to him or eat meals with him? I don't think that's what Paul is implying. Paul's concern is that the association or is for the association between the unrepentant sinner and the church. The point is that once discipline has been carried out, it should not be business as usual. Paul's saying that person shouldn't keep coming to the church potluck as if nothing's changed because things have changed dramatically. There needs to be a clear and tangible degree of separation that lets the sinning person know and anyone looking on, letting them know as well that they're no longer one of us. They're no longer considered a member because of their sinfulness. So we should not act in ways that empathize with their sin or, or justify, justify their sin as well. So you shouldn't speak with them in ways that undermine the church's decision. That's really what Paul is getting at. You should speak with them about Jesus. You should encourage them to turn to him and put their faith in him. Talk to them about their need for the gospel. Talk to them about where they're at spiritually. Be kind and loving to them. But they can't be welcomed among us as a brother or sister. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Paul is saying. 
It means that they go from being considered a Christian to someone that we hope becomes a Christian. That's the distinction. We still can speak with them, but the way we speak to them, the way we treat them, the way that we interact with them has changed. Because as far as the church is concerned, they are no longer a Christian. So generally speaking, a person disciplined out of the church, out of membership, would be welcomed in our services as any other unbeliever would be. There may be specific circumstances where that's not the case, but generally speaking, they would be allowed and even encouraged to come to our services. We wouldn't recognize their prior baptism. They wouldn't be allowed to participate in communion with us. They would be, as an unbeliever, in our midst. But being disciplined out of the church, it doesn't have to be the end of their story. There is still hope for anyone who has been disciplined, for anyone who doesn't know Jesus. They may not presently be a Christian, but at any point, they can become a Christian. And that's what we're hoping for. We don't hope for repentance only until we get to the end of step three and then we're done with them. We continue to pray for them, continue to pursue them, continue to love them because our desire is that they would turn and put their faith in Jesus and come back and rejoin as a member. And church, if that day comes where they repent, they turn to Jesus, man, we would welcome them with open arms. That's the whole point of the church discipline process. Our desire for their repentance does not end after they're disciplined out of the church. Now I know that there's many, maybe some even in this room, who struggle with this whole process. They feel it is overly harsh. They feel it's an overstep of the church. They feel it's wrong for the church to make such judgments. That we have no right to decide whether or not someone's faith is genuine. But it really shouldn't surprise us. This concept is very, very common everywhere else on earth. Any business or company you've ever been a part of, I'm sure they have values or a code of conduct that you have to abide by. And if you don't, they will terminate your association with that body. It shouldn't be surprising that the church has a standard as well. There are standards to maintain membership in the local church. And further than that, God himself has given us the authority to maintain those standards and to make such judgments as we've been speaking about already. Look at the next verse with me, verse 18. <clears throat> Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. As soon as Jesus finishes explaining the process of church discipline. He tells his disciples that they and the rest of the church by association have the authority to bind and loose on earth. And whatever they bind and loose on earth is going to also be bound and loosed in heaven. It's clear from the context that this is deeply connected to the discipline process. But to really grasp what it means to, uh, to bind and loose, there are two passages that we must consider. The first one is in Matthew chapter 16. It should be just one page back from where you're at. But I'm going to read Matthew 16, verse 19. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we're seeing the binding and loosing language again here, uh, just two chapters earlier while Jesus is talking to Peter. But he also tells Peter that he would give him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So binding and loosing is related to church discipline. It's also related to having the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But what does that refer to? Great question, church, because all of this language actually is a reference back to the book of Isaiah. So we're gonna look at one more passage here briefly. Isaiah chapter 22, and you can follow along with me. I'm gonna read verses 20 through 22. It says, in that day... I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and will bind your sash on him and will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open." In the verses just before what we read from Isaiah chapter 22, 
we see that there is a sinful and prideful man who served as, as one of the most important stewards in the house of the king. But God promised that, that wicked steward that he was going to be violently removed from his position and he would put a more fitting man in place, a man named Eliakim. And God promises Eliakim to receive the royal robes, the sash, and the authority. And then he says that he would receive the key to the house of David. The holder of the key to the king's house had a very large amount of authority. It was up to them to determine who had access to the king, who would be permitted an audience with the king. And his decisions were final. Whatever he opened, no one could close. Yeah, no one could close. And whatever he closed, no one could open. Only the king himself could undo this man's decision. So this is describing a, a, a position of great honor and authority. He could permit or deny entrance to the king. You could only come see the king if, you were, uh, if he deemed it worthy. This position of authority would have needed a great measure of trust between the king and the holder of the key. The king had to be very certain that this key holder was going to do a good job. He could make the king's life very dif difficult if he did not. Now back to Matthew 18. With the binding and loosing language, Jesus is comparing us to Eliakim from Isaiah 22. Jesus is saying that just, just as the king would entrust Eliakim to determine who could enter into his presence, now Jesus, the truest king, has trusted us, has vested authority in his church to bind and loose, to open and shut. They have the authority to determine who belongs in the kingdom and who does not belong in the kingdom. So contrary to what many would say, the church has every right to judge whether someone's faith is genuine. And we've been commanded by Jesus to do exactly that. Now I want to make two points of clarification here. First, the church does not save people, and the church does not distribute salvation to people. When a person is, is disciplined out of the church, the church is not saying, we're revoking your salvation. The church is saying that your life is so enmeshed with sin, so characterized by unrepentance, that we don't believe you've truly embraced the salvation Jesus offers. So I want to be clear, the church has not been given authority to determine what the gospel is or who can accept the gospel. But it has been given the authority to determine whether a profession of belief in the gospel is true or false based on the lifestyle that a person chooses to live. And when the church makes that assessment, we act accordingly, not mistreating the disciplined person, but treating them as an unbeliever. Second point of clarification, the church's authority to do this extends only so far as we are obedient to the commands and the will of Jesus. We must operate according to the commands of Scripture here. Discipline is only carried out when there is clear evidence that somebody is living in contradiction to the Word of God. But verse 18 is a direct stamp of approval from Jesus on the church carrying out church discipline. And verses 19 through 20 teach essentially the same thing as well. Let's take a look at those verses before we finish up today. <clears throat> Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. These two verses are two of the most frequently misunderstood verses in the Bible. Verse 19 does not mean that if two Christians agree on any matter or any desire, that God will grant them that desire. If that were the case, we'd have a building by now because I'm sure I'm not the only one that's on board for that. Verse 20 is not a call to worship for small groups. It can't mean that Jesus is only present when there are more than one believer because Jesus is certainly present in our quiet times and our times spent in prayer and in the word of God. Certainly he is present there. Still, it is true that Jesus is present when we gather in his name 
And I actually don't think there's anything wrong with using this in your call to worship, but I think so often we do it that way without ever acknowledging or even uh, recognizing the original context these words were spoken in. Both of these verses are further affirmation of the church's authority to pronounce judgments on the genuineness of an individual's profession of faith. The word that we we translate as anything here in verse 19, uh, it's a word often used in judicial contexts which makes sense because they were using some judicial language back in verses 15 through 17. The things being prayed here for then are specific requests related to and for the purpose of rightly exercising the authority that God has given the church to carry out church discipline. This is about God's affirmation of the church to take the steps outlined in verses 15 through 17. But I want to focus in on one other detail here. Church discipline is not and is never an individual process. If two of you agree, if two or three are gathered, there's a plurality there. The authority that the church has has not been given to us as individuals. It is something the gathered church has collectively. Jesus has given us the authority to exercise church discipline, and I underline and I italicized us because that is so important here. Pastor Garrett does not discipline anyone out of the church. He does not have that authority. The church does. You do not have the authority to pronounce judgment, pronounce the judgment that somebody's faith is not genuine. You yourself do not have that authority. The gathered church has that authority. We gather in the name of Jesus and we exercise that authority he has given us together. And when the church gathers, we can do that. We function as his representatives. We exercise the authority he's given us. But that authority is collective, not individual. And keeping church discipline where it belongs in the hands of the whole church is so, so, so important. It protects everyone. It protects you from from having this this process abused and and wielded against you as a weapon. It prevents leaders from having this abused uh, on their behalf as well. So Jesus has shown us how to practice church discipline. He's commanded us to practice church discipline. And he's told us that he's given us the authority to do it. It is unfortunate, church, when we have to do this. It is painful. It is not fun. It is uncomfortable, but it is ultimately for the benefit of the individual because that whole way we are continuing to lovingly pursue them, calling them to repentance, calling them to faith in Jesus. It's also good for the church. We saw last week in 1 Peter that God has called us to be holy. We must We must protect and maintain the holiness of the church because a failure to do so destroys our witness. This process helps protect the church and it strengthens its witness. Church, I hope that that over the last two weeks, this week and the previous week, we've helped you to understand the place and the necessity of church discipline for healthy churches. But church, I also hope that this has served as a warning to you because no one in this room is above church discipline. No members, I guess that is. We can't discipline anybody that's not a member. I am not above this church. The elders are not above this. The deacons are not above this. None of you are above the process of church discipline. And if you are walking in unrepentant sin, you risk putting yourself under church discipline. And even worse you risk misrepresenting God to the world around you. My friends, you might think that you've got it under control, that your your sin is hidden and tucked away and no one's gonna know about it so it doesn't matter that much. But please listen, Uh, hidden sin, man, it, it has a way of wiggling its way to the surface. It will come to light. Don't let it get to that point. Don't let it get to the point where the church must intervene. Deal with that now. Confess that to another brother. Ask him to hold you accountable. Confess that sin to the Lord and repent. 
If you're walking in sin, please know that Jesus is faithful to forgive you. It doesn't matter how big you've screwed up. He will forgive you. So don't persist in that sin. Repent, confess it to Jesus, and turn back to him. Walk in the holiness we've been called to walk in. Don't invite church discipline. Put away the wicked and sinful behavior and be holy as God is holy. Pray with me, church. Heavenly Father, as we look at a passage like this where you command us to pursue one another with grace and humility and love, we are reminded of your relentless pursuit of us. Lord, because though we we sin often, though we do not do all that we should, you continue to love us and lavish your mercy and grace upon us. And Lord, we are so grateful for that. We are so grateful that, that you sent your son to redeem us from our sin, that we might walk in newness of life. Lord, help us to imitate your mercy and your pursuit in the way that we treat one another. Lord, as we see somebody who strays and errs, let us call them faithfully to turn and repent and and come back to you. And God, I pray if there are any in here today that are harboring hidden sin, convict them. Let them confess it to you, confess it to another believer and help them to repent and turn from that sin that, Lord willing, this process won't be needed again in the future. Father, we love you. We are so grateful to be your people. We pray that you would get all of the honor in the remainder of this service and the meeting to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.